So we are running a little bit late, so we are going to go straight to the most exciting part of this session. And I am incredibly happy uh, to be able to welcome and introduce uh, Mathieu Lubari, who is an amazing volunteer and activist in Uganda, co-founder of Community Creativity for Development, an organization operating in the Rhino camp, refugee camp in Northern Uganda, where they are inventing the future of repair in a frugal and creative and incredibly insp inspiring ways. And it's really an honor to have Matthew with us, particularly considering that until less than a month ago, he was not yet holding a passport. And it is literally a miracle that we are here with him today. And uh, so I'd love you to give him a warm welcome. You'll We've known Matthew for the past year uh, and a bit, and uh, you know he reached out to us, and we kind of could tell straight away that he had a lot to say, and we we've learned already so much from uh, uh, communicating and engaging with him and his group, and I'm sure we'll learn a lot more today and throughout the weekend. So, without any further ado, uh, I'll give the floor to Matthew and we'll just switch to his presentation and here we go. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. <clears throat> Hello, fixers. <laughs> Are you guys not happy? <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, I'm so happy to be here. I'm called Matthew Lubari. And uh, I come from South Sudan, originally, but I live in Uganda as a refugee. I came to Uganda since 2016, when uh, the war, which is we call the man-made problems that happened back home, and uh, forced us to come to Uganda where we came in separate directions. Mother came in a different way. The kids, everyone, you know, came in a very different direction. And uh, so happy that today I'm here and to share my story with you guys. Um, Rainocam Refugee Settlement, it's uh, located in the northwest of Uganda, and uh, it hosts about uh, 120,000 refugees from South Sudan, Rwanda, Burundi, DR Congo, and uh, Central Africa Republic. But majorly, Many of the refugees are from South Sudan, where I come from. And I happen to be a co-founder and at the same time the director for Community Creativity for Development, which is located in the Rhino Camp Refugee Settlement in a small village called Eden. And uh, Community Creativity for Development, uh, it was formed uh, when we realized that there was a gap in repair and reuse of electronics within the settlement. And uh, we are a group of three co-founders, two gentlemen and uh, one female. So it's a little bit balanced, but not fully. When we talk about 
gender inclusion, right? So though it's not yet balanced, but I think uh, we are going to do the balancing. And uh, we had been on ground since uh, uh, 2021, but originally the idea came up in 2019. So a year, like uh, uh, two years, then we became so operational, like visible on ground. The other years we were trying to put things you know, in place and uh, so that we establish ourselves well. And the aim is to connect communities while protecting the environment from global warming. So that is the major uh, uh, aim of community creativity for development. Uh, we have a vision of a transformed day community uh, that is fully in control of the available, I mean, the, the socioeconomic well-being using the available resources uh, so that to protect the environment from global warming, promote openness, reduce poverty, and build peace among the community. Uh, those are the figures, and this is the aerial photography taken in 2021 of a small village in Rhino Camp, and it's called Ochia. And uh, Rhino Camp has up to 30,000 households and uh, up to seven zones. Of course, the biggest zone has uh, 12,051 households. And all those people, you know, uh, have devices in their hands. And uh, those includes items for lightning and energy, communication and information, uh, mechanical, so electrical items, and textiles uh, items. Of course, the clothes, the mobile phones, bicycles, and uh, solar lanterns, which were distributed to the refugees during arrival in 2016. And uh, we have quite a number of activities that we do. First thing is the repair of electronics that we, we carry on at least on a daily basis. And uh, we quite do it in a different way that I'm going to tell you about. And uh, we do also trainings on the repair and uh, providing ICT mentorship, including digital competence uh, training where we train the refugees themselves on how they can use the smartphone to access information, how they can use a laptop to browse or play music. Uh, and this is aimed you know, at uh, relieving the stress that has been caused by the war so that someone can live you know, in a stressless environment. And uh, we do also awareness raising on a repair and reuse, including uh, e-waste management, and uh, we also do upcycling of some of the items, though not all. Back to the story, how things started. And uh, it started in 2017 to 2018 when I was in the Rhino Calm refugee settlement, I came, uh, managed to fluke with a zip of tools. Right away you can see a screwdriver, a cutter, a toothbrush, and a scissor, which had helped me to push things on 
much as power issues were there, no tools, no table, good table where you can put something, the electronic device on it, but we had to continue and at least provide services to the community. I was joined with a lady who is now a gender activist in pro promoting uh, women inclusion in repair cafe or in repair culture. And uh, she's called Edina Dawa right here. She appears in different pictures. And uh, coming to October 2018 to 2020, we had our first repair cafe event, which was introduced by an organization called Rogue Agents. Uh, it's a Berlin-based organization that supports refugees in Uganda, in South Sudan, and also it supports people in post-conflict areas in Cameroon. And uh, they were the first uh, organization that introduced Repair Cafe in the settlement and sparked up things. But before that, I want to tell you some three things that inspired me to do repair. One is my dad. My dad is a medical personnel, but he likes fixing things. I used to watch him when I was a little kid, 12 to 14 years. I could watch him uh, fixing his watch and his radio. He loved listening to news. Currently, we don't stay together. He's back in the country, but sometimes we communicate on phone. So five years, I haven't set my eyes on him, but he's doing good. Second thing, um, was when I had my first smartphone. I placed it on a table and one of my cousins tried to play around with it and locked my phone. So I was locked out. I couldn't access anything in my phone because the security was turned in a different thing. So when I took it to the technician, I asked, can you fix for me my phone? Say, yeah, I can fix for you. It was uh, guys from India. And uh, while repairing, he told me to go and wait outside. Because he never wanted me to see how he fixed things. But I tend to stood somewhere where I can peep and see what he was doing. And I was watching closely what he was doing, how he was moving his hands while trying to fix my phone. So he asked for money. And that time it was a lot of money for me because I didn't have a job. And that was in 2013. I was still a student. So painfully, I paid the money. But it has challenged me, and I went back home with that phone. I got online, did some bit of research on how to fix the same problem. I locked the phone and unlocked it. And I was happy when I unlocked it. I got challenged. I was like, no, I need to teach people how to repair. I want to make repair open. 
Third thing was also in 2013 in Kampala. I used my laptop in the evening, coming to the morning, tried to open it, could not power on. Took to a technician, he tried to fix it, he failed. Instead of giving me my laptop in a good shape, he removed some parts. So sad. My hard drive disk got changed. The network adapter was taken, and I was like, damn. Is it how things are done? So he told me, we can't work on your, uh, your, 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 your computer, it's dead. So I took it to a certain place, it's called uh, PC World. When I reached there, they first looked at the screws and they told me, your computer someone tampered with and they opened, so we can't help work it for you because it's already opened by someone. I got angry, I stood by, I was like, just help me open, I want to see. When he checked, so your network card got taken and your hard disk has changed. When I reached back to the very person who first opened my, my laptop, oh, he almost fought me. But I never had power because I was young, so I had to let it go and my laptop just ended. So those three scenarios, you know, made me to take repair up and teach people openly how to fix things. So uh, back to this story. Uh, well, in 2018, when the first repair cafe happened and this organization, Rogue Agents, gave me one of the toolbox. That kit, the black kit is called Ascotech. And Ascotech means access to skills, knowledge, and network. It's a toolkit that comprises of mechanical tools uh, for, I mean, uh, tools also for fixing mobile phones, uh, and other uh, things for mending, because it has needles inside where you can mend your clothes. So uh, it's kind of having a lot of uh, things inside. And I was given the empty tool kit with only a solar iron, multimeter, and a manual a repair manual, which also comprises of uh, how someone can build a solar charger and uh, build solar panels. So I took this um, toolkit and tried to fill it up. But while trying to fill it up, it was very hard for me because I'm in a refugee camp and there's no money. So every time we wanted to repair, we go borrow the other full toolkit which was given to another hub. So we had to borrow and, and try to, to use for fixing. And I also got involved in um, responding to research questions from different researchers, but mostly from the European countries. Being involved in these interviews, you know, it opened up my mind a lot, where I was able to contribute largely. Some researchers, I could tell them, you know, I don't have internet, 
maybe if we could provide me internet, then I can be able to be online and share with you how we do things. And of course, some responded. An example, one of a researcher called Felipe, I don't know, might be here. Um, but he, he did respond it and sent me some airtime. And uh, some individuals as well did uh, trusted us and were able to support us when I tried to initiate establishment of the organization. I'm very proud and happy today to meet Sam. Mr. Arthur Donaldson, please. I'm so happy to see you. He has been so instrumental and he risked to support, though we never met. It was just on text, but he trusted and supported a lot. Coming to the restart project, uh, it was last year when I came to meet online with the restarters. So I was going through searching the word repairs and boom, I landed on the repair on the restart projects Facebook page, made a comment of what I'm up to and I got a response through the Facebook page to send a concept note and a budget. When I sent, we went into discussions with Ugo, had a virtual call. Uh, that was in October. And yeah, the feedback was nice. And uh, in December, we got nominated to receive some grants to support the initiative. It was worth 5,000. US dollars, and which has led to the establishment of CC4D, where you see that house. It was so great. And uh, after that, we were able to join the Restarters group. Imagine. By then I was doing the repair because I got challenged in one way or the other. Some people made me to, to do it and to teach, but I never knew I was contributing for the planet, like preventing the planet from global warming. But when I joined the team of the restarters and with other colleagues, I was able to learn new things about how repair contributes to the planet. So incredible. Whereby I was able to meet other researchers and be able to meet Repair Cafe Malmo. And I fix it, team. Through the Repair Cafe Malmo, we were able to receive I fix it tools a business tool bag all the way. I think I, I still don't remember the location which was sent, but up to Rhino Cam refugee settlement in the deep village. That's why we say repair is everywhere. Okay. And I used to say repair has no boundaries. Can be done by anybody at any time. So um, what we have so far done as an organization, we had done trainings where we trained 35 refugees, 20 males and 15 females. 
And uh, we were advocating for women inclusion in repair culture because women in our site, they fear touching electronics. So we wanted to tell them that please don't fear to touch electronics. It doesn't kill. <laughs> Do fix it. And we are encouraging the women technicians and which has packed a lot. And uh, more women are interested, you know, enjoying being the, the repair or to become technicians. We also hold up to six repair cafe events where up to 350 items were fixed. And those includes the mobile phones, the radios, solar lights or the solar lanterns, solar inverters, computers, bicycles, clothes, and footwear. So it's sort of not a specialized one but it's a remix, mix of things, because we never wanted to leave one part out, but at least help in a broader way. That's why we are doing that. And we do it in our small space, and sometimes we go out to other areas, though it's quite challenging to reach some of the parts due to long distance from one village to another. And we also do provide access to tools for the community. When someone wants to fix something, they come to the center and fix their thing or take the tool and return it back. We also do the collection and upcycling of electronics waste. So over there, it's quite an innovation that we tried out on making wooden electrical extension cables, which is aimed at replacing the electrical extension cables made out of plastic waste. So we are kind of sifting, like trying to eliminate the, the plastic waste or reduce the plastic waste. I know it's quite not easy to do that, but we try to, uh, to put it up a little bit. And uh, we collect some of the e-waste items from the community though it's quite challenging for someone you know, to give their dead electronics. The culture is different. Everyone wants to keep, even if it's dead, but they want just to keep it and keep seeing it there. Yeah. And sometimes those, when upcycling those things, uh, especially the solar lights, we rebuild them and make it work again by removing some of the components and uh, try to put in a different board or solder them and make it work. We also had the awareness on e-waste management to the community where we have reached over 500 community members with messages on safe disposal of electronics waste, whereby we encourage them to bring to our small center for safe keeping. And uh, we also uh, tell them the good news on repair and reuse of items. Why we need to repair the items, we, we give them that information and it has changed the mindset of the community, yeah. And uh, above all, while doing this, we also create employment to the youths, because when we, those youths that we trained, we always involve them in our repair sessions. And 
they quickly respond. And when they respond, whenever we get something small for coffee or transport, we give them and everyone goes back happy at the end of the day. And we are able to buy airtime and access information. But along the way, we had been challenged with uh, challenges. And the biggest problem is the lack of spare parts and the high prices of the spare parts. And that is something, uh, even yesterday, it's being talked about. The other thing is the quality of the products. You find the market is being uh, flopped by poor quality products, which does not last for long. You buy it, doesn't take a year, it's broken and can't be fixed. So sad. And the limited tools that we have, and sometimes the software locks. Some of the community members, we are not able to help them to unlock those software locks because we couldn't have the tools or the manuals how to unlock them. And the mobility issues, which has also hindered us. And above all, the lack of funds has really, really put us not to expand to other areas, despite the long, the bigger population <coughs> that is in Rhino Camp. And the power issue as well is also one of our biggest problem in the settlement. Access to reliable power, it's not there, and we don't have a very good conducive storage to store lots of the items for the community. So in the lesson learned is that the poor quality products and the community behaviors towards repair has been you know, changed because of the awareness that we have done to the community. But much as we have done the awareness, there's still a huge number of electronic items that are not working and needed to be fixed. And they are still in the hands of the community members. And uh, the Repair Cafe, it promotes peaceful coexistence among us, the refugees and the host communities within the refugee settlement. Because when we came, you know, there are different tribes. And there are specific tribes back home that, like, there's that hatred among some of our tribes. Because say, you caused the war, or you caused this. So still, when it came to the camp, there's still that hatred in the minds of the refugees. But with the community repair cafes, we are able to bring all those community together during the repairs and they were able to converse normally, yeah, without any friction. And at the, at the end of the day, you walk together, chat, and peace has been promoted. So repair cafe event, it promotes peace in conflict-related areas. I'm not going to read uh, all this because of time, but I think it might be shared online and uh, can be, you know, uh, someone can easily read uh, most of the, the things. Uh, we have some few recommendations, and it's in the sub line of supporting the repair cafe centers, since it's a very good platform for the community. And uh, we also look forward to creating more awareness raising on the repair culture. And we're also thinking of if repair could be introduced in schools early enough so that people grow up with the culture of the repair. Because you find there it's different that it's normally introduced 
uh, at institutions, higher institutions or universities as short courses, but has the basics has not been, you know, uh, put right away from the foundation. So we believe that when it's introduced at the early, early stage, it can change people's behaviors and people can really take it up and reduce a bigger number of waste. And uh, we have a bigger picture that we had put. We look forward to put more repair cafe events. Uh, uh, establish also at least a repair cafe event in a zone, but that doesn't happen if we don't join our hands together. Because one person cannot be able to lift a very huge stone. But together, we believe that we can uh, push it hard and we can achieve our goal. And these are the people or the partners that we had been uh, working together that has been supporting us. Um, most of you know all this that I've been talking. And this is the smaller team that uh, is behind CC4D. It's a young, talented team and which has various skills in fixing mobile phones, uh, electrical items, and uh, laptops, uh, bicycles. And we have also, they act also as photographers. The pictures that you see are also taken by uh, the big team that you see in front. And these are our contacts. In case you want to reach us, feel free to reach us and welcome support from anyone from anywhere. Repair has no boundary. And repair is everywhere. OK? I'm so happy to be here and to share my story, though it has been long. But I'm happy, and uh, I welcome if there are questions. This is a team of uh, women that we trained on repair and we call them our women technicians. So they are good at fixing now and whenever we go for repair cafes, we always call them to participate. And they are also inspiring more women to join the repair culture. Thank you so much, and I welcome questions or comments. Thank you so, so much, Matthew. I We'll open the floor to questions with the caveat that we are obviously running already behind. So we, in, for respect to all the sessions next, we postpone everything by 20 minutes. So your program mentally adapt everything by 20 minutes and shorten slightly the lunch, okay? In a very dictatorial way, I just decided this. And so there's a few minutes for questions for Matthew or comments. You want to translate that? No, questions. Oh, oh. Any question? Uh, my name is uh, Carla Frans. I'm from the municipality of Apeldoorn. A very interesting presentation, uh, completely different world for me, um, but very interesting to hear. And I was wondering, you also were talking about um, recycling, reusing uh, e-waste. 
Where does it come from, the e-waste? Sorry? Where does it come from, the e-waste? Does it come from out of the camp? Yeah, uh, from within the camp. Yeah? Yeah. Not from out of the... Yeah, not from... Uh, because we are currently operating within the camp settings. Thank you. Really great presentation. What outside of the camp? What is the repair situation in in Uganda in general? Is it are there is there a right to repair uh, community based repair going on more broadly in Uganda, or is this really mostly just in the camp? Uh, thank you. Uh, the repair situation in Uganda is that mostly uh, it's in the cities that you find the commercial repairs. But I've never seen a community repair cafe center being uh, operating or running in Uganda. But uh, we are the first who are doing community repair cafes which are not paid for. Hi again, um, my name is Louise. I, I work with the French Red Cross and uh, congratulations for the project. It's very, very impressive and I have tons of questions, but uh, I'll just keep one for now. Uh, with the upcycling that you're doing and the, the new models that you're creating, like the, the wooden charging stations, uh, do you have a way or a kind of Wikipedia where you're sharing the models that you're testing outside of CC4D. Thank you. Yeah, sure, uh, we do. And uh, we always also publish uh, our information online, especially how someone can make that. And uh, we are currently doing uh, uh, its documentary documenting it online on Wikifactory. So hopefully we are going to, uh, to share it globally so that people can access. Hi, Matthew. This is Purna. And uh, it's a great uh, presentation. And uh, thanks for presenting it and exploring and sharing your information. I would like to know that have you been able to connect with the other uh, local repair pe persons uh, in your community because Africa and Uganda is known for its innovations. And uh, uh, have you been able to connect with them in any way? I mean, I don't know where exactly you stay, how it's reachable or not reachable, but the, the knowledge is immense, I mean. Um. We are not able to connect with many of them, but there are a few of them that we are able to, to connect. Yeah. But most of them, you know, uh, those are commercial uh, fixers. And uh, it's quite hard for them, you know, to, to narrow themselves back to the community and to provide uh, repairs at a free cost. Any more questions? Just a quick one. I've, and what's the situation on power? Do you have, you, presumably in the refugee camp, you have no grid power. Um, is it all solar, solar cells and inverters? Um, do you have, have you know, uh, AC power to power all of these devices, or is it all DC? Um, Power is still a problem in, uh, in the refugee camp because there is no particular organization or humanitarian organization that has taken up to provide power in the settlement. So uh, it's not reliable. So during our operations, we, we had our small little generator that we carry whenever I want to do the, the repairs, and uh, we're, not, we're not neat. Um, our repairs usually take eight hours or six hours a day, 
But our center remains open Monday to Friday, where people bring, you know, uh, their gadgets for fixing. But power is a very great challenge. Thank you so, so much. And uh, feel free, obviously, to chat and learn more uh, from Matthew throughout the weekend. Thanks again. And uh, now to the next round of sessions. Thanks. Thank you.